Thank you for having me here. Um, so to continue on the theme of urban cycling, uh, my thesis, which is called Bicycle Factory, a Post-Post-Fordist Urban Intervention, focuses on cycling infrastructure and the production of bicycles in the city. It touches on some of the challenges we face today in the developed world in which major cities are grappling with um, increasing Leave uh, densifying cores, redeveloping former industrial sites, such as those along railway corridors, bolstering local manufacturing economy, as well as implementing more sustainable means of transportation. Um, first, I'll introduce some of the economical, political, and cultural concepts behind the research, including um, Toronto's urban morphology, a brief history of bicycles and factories, Fordism and post-Fordism, then I'll take you through the specific events of the architectural design proposal, which is the bicycle factory in Toronto, as part of the envisioned post-post-Fordist future. So this is the view from my 23rd floor apartment building on Bloor Street West, overlooking the Junction neighborhood in Toronto. You'll see that the most prominent element in this photo is the railway corridor, um, which basically slices the urban fabric in two. Um, currently, it services the GO commuter train and Union Pearson Express running along what used to be freight train tracks. Um, now, all of these adjacent sites used to be industrial lots with factories um, for direct shipping access. In fact, I'm sure many of you are familiar with Sterling Road, the Sterling Road neighborhood with artist studios and local businesses, which is just south of this location, um, where the Nestle Chocolate Factory still operates. The rest of the urban fabric here is largely covered with single-family homes with apartment building space here and there. But you can see how quickly these sites are being redeveloped with two construction sites visible in the foreground and new mid-rise housing development just beyond. And additionally, the West Toronto Rail Path runs along the east side of the tracks. Um, like most major urban entities, Toronto is a city that was heavily influenced and shaped by the automobile during the 20th century. So Henry Ford revolutionized the economic, social, and urban landscape with its mass production and proliferation, um, effectively creating a car-oriented culture. In fact, it was so influential that we called it Fordism. Cars and car-sized roads took over. Factories, once sitting within their local markets, were pushed further and further from the urban core until offshored entirely to the develop developing world. So. These transformations left scars in our cities as 19th century railways and other industrial remnants now impede on the human scale of urban life. But today, after decades of aggressive industrialization, the bicycle in the factory can help foster a more sustainable contemporary city by reintegrating light manufacturing activity back into the urban fabric and promoting the bicycle as everyday transportation. So let's talk about the bicycle. Uh, when bicycles were first introduced in the late 19th century, it created the great bicycle boom of the 1890s. There were de democratic personal machines that liberated both men and women, adults and children. And yet the, base the bicycle's basic design has remained the same since its invention over a century ago. It is one of the most nearly perfect pieces of design known due to the extreme amount of refinement it has undergone over the last century and its purity of form. It also has the potential to create healthy, thriving, sustainable cities. While the bicycle has been an established fixture for commuters in Europe for decades, particularly as cities in Denmark and the Netherlands started building extensive cycling networks by the late 1970s in response to the energy crisis, urban cycling has only recently begun to resurface in North America. Okay, so now let's talk about the factory. Um, one of the greatest revolutions that took place at the turn of the century, of the 20th century, was Ford's legacy with the introduction of mass production, enabled by the innovation of the assembly line, allowing ordinary citizens to be able to afford luxury items beyond their basic needs. The Fordist model of production was a systematically designed organization of people and machinery in specific spatial sequence. They operated on a succession of identical items, which circulated along a fixed path through progressive stages of assembly. Efficiency was derived from the mechanization of moving parts and the repetitive motions of the stationary worker and machinery at each segment. The fallout, however, was the capitalist exploitation of labor, which created a culture of class oppression, wage slavery, and poor working conditions. 
But the efficiency afforded by the system and its large open architectural manifestations was so effective that factories around the world started emulating Ford's factories and production model, such as the Lingotto factory in Italy, which has a test track on the roof. Ford then re-revolutionized his own production theories by applying the assembly line at the urban scale, that is, city as machine, at the, river, uh, at the Ford River Rouge complex, which in effect was a factory the size of an entire city block configured as an assembly line. It accomplished the entire production process on site from raw materials to the finished product. The Industrial Revolution brought about a lot of pollution and industrial slums, as well as vast railway and other transportation infrastructure that destroy the human scale of the city. The modernist movement attempted to fix these spatial conundrums with town planning proposals uh, influenced by Ford's philosophy, which translated into idealized and homogenized segregated parcels of function in the city, such as Garden City and many of Le Corbusier's proposals. So by late Fordism in the post-World War II era in the 1950s and 60s, as industry was dispersed and decentralized, extensive highway systems were constructed to connect them. This was the birth of suburbia, in which housing became a standardized, mass-produced commodity as any other object manufactured on the assembly line. The demise of Fordism was replaced by post-Fordism in the 1970s, which was a reaction to its predecessor's philosophies of identical homogenization of society and top-down state control. Throughout post-Fordism, global economic interdependency created a scenario in which factories were increasingly offshored from advanced economies to developing countries as, de as developed nations abandoned factories and embraced the industry of service uh, and logistics. So why are factories important? Well, manufacturing in many ways is the foundation of the economy with their multiplying and trickle-down effect for the local economy. It creates jobs in the city, which decentrifies neighborhoods by bringing in blue-collar jobs, thus creating more mixed-income neighborhoods. By bringing factories and light manufacturing activity back into the city, we can start creating a local economy toward a sustainable urban spatial paradigm through localization and densification. And this is crucial because we now know that the heterogeneous layers of the urban fabric cannot be undermined, as they directly inform the vibrancy and vitality of the city. This is viewed in contrast to the mono-industrial regions of lay Fordism, or the vacant and ghostly factory shell remnants of post-Fordism, which were supplanted by service, operation, and management. We now know, what Jane Jacobs predicted as early as the 1960s, that balanced, thriving cities require high-quality physical artifacts, factories, transportation infrastructure, pedestrian-skilled public spaces, in order to generate the kind of friction needed in the city for social collision, interaction, and exchange. So what should we expect from post-post-Fordism? So I've sort of made up post-post-Fordism. Um, so I, this is the equation that I've used in my thesis. Some um, we take the good parts of Fordism plus the good parts of post-Fordism, some counter-culture trends that are happening right now, and some new ideas. So again, the post-post-Fordism movement combines virtues from the philosophies and strategies both of Portis, uh, Fordist, Fordist, Fordist and post-Fordist eras by continuing certain ideas while discontinuing, discontinuing others. In the ideal contemporary city, the post-post-Fordist era brings light manufacturing activity back into the urban realm to connect, reconnect producers, workers, and consumers while providing fair working conditions for the blue-collar class, eliminating the exploitation of cheap labor in offshore factories overseas. The sustainable post-post-Florida city also integrates extensive cycling networks into its urban fabric. Now let's talk about site. So this is this, uh, I'm going to talk about the site that I chose for my design proposal. So the site chosen for the bicycle factory is a hallmark remnant of Toronto's Florida's industrial past. Typical of most major North American cities, manufacturing plants settled along the waterfront or gravitated towards the outskirts of town. But as the city grew, these operations migrated along with the expanding perimeter, leaving be behind growth rings of abandoned or repurposed factory buildings. Usually developed along major shipment routes such as railroads, these industrial regions and their supporting transport systems were eventually engulfed into the urban fabric, creating irregular geometries. Usually developed along major shipment routes such as railroads, oops, 
Um, so, sitting at the junction where several Toronto neighborhoods meet, the site is located within a confluence of transportation arteries. Um, walking, cycling, TTC streetcar, and TTC buses are among the network of different modes of local travel. And the GO Transit and UP Express commuter um, rail lines run along the edges of the property. The West Toronto Rail Path also runs along the west side set of tracks. As you can see, the rail corridors essentially create a wall in the city. They cut through and bifurcate the entire west end of the city, effectively impeding passage on either side of the trajectories. The cycling network, particularly its east-west passage, is compromised by this blockage in the urban fabric. And the city's west end bikeways plan showing existing and proposed bike lanes offers a roundabout solution at best. This land use plan shows that almost the entire swath of land around the railway lands is designated as employment areas. That's the purple. Even though more and more lots are succumbing to the pressure of a growing city and converting, converting into loft apartments and new condominiums. So here are a few site photos showing the two railroads that flank the, the triangular site and the former industrial buildings that line the rail corridor along the path. Um, so the site was chosen for its irregular shape and dramatic photography, the layering of continuous semi-private corridors with road networks, and its situation in a rich and complex urban context, possesses the potential to generate design parameters and constraints that provide fertile fodder for the production of compelling architecture, urban infrastructure, and public space. So the design intervention. So. The final project is an amalgamation of city, factory, and bicycle. So from the existing urban plan, a new master plan is proposed. More than just a bicycle factory and deeply embedded in the urban fabric, the intervention stacks different layer, layers of different programs on the site. Industry and employment, public space and recreation, infrastructure and transportation, while maintaining congruity in the neighbor's built height. This programmatic and formal strategy directly challenges patterns of, herbal, um, of urban development through, throughout the Industrial Revolution, Fordist, and post-Fordist eras. It unfolds as a microcosm of the ideal post-post-Fordist city, as bicycle factories, cycling infrastructures, and public spaces interweave in, around, and throughout each other to create a complex, multifaceted architectural artifact. So pedestrian and cycling bridges dissolve the knot in the urban fabric, reconnecting portions of the city, which were split apart by the large-scale rail infrastructures built to service 19th century factories. They stitch seamlessly into the urban fabric. So the first spine, the College Sororan Bridge, completes the east-west connection along, across the railway tracks. And the second spine, the modified extension of phase two of the West Toronto Rail Path, bridges over the rail lines toward the city center. Two paths converge at the intersection in the middle of the urban park, but also branch off to provide more direct express lanes through the factory building itself. The hybrid typology of factory, pedestrian, and cycling bridge, urban park, velodrome, and bike park create intertwining public and private spaces that participate as active components of urban life. So the factory is a large, open, single-story space supported by a semi-regular column grid and deep waffle slab roof with abundant natural light provided by large windows, skylights, and courtyards. The pedestrian and cycling bridge are bridges that split and reconnect along their paths to traverse over or through the factory building. And the urban park is a large outdoor space with pavilions housing various public amenities, cycling paths, greenery, and an assortment of landscape furniture objects, and it sits on top of the factory. The velodrome is a full-size outdoor velodrome track suspended on cables and masts over the urban park. And finally, the bike park is an outdoor bike park with uh, dirt mounds below the elevated factory building. As a result, the factory is also able to, to adopt a high degree of transparency in its manufacturing process by bleeding the public realm right into its spaces of production, including integration of the urban cycling network within its facilities. The large flexible spatial requirements of the factory is articulated as a mass, a form directly extruded from the boundaries of the site for maximum floor area. The volume is then lifted on pillow T so that the top of its roof slab, the surface of the urban park, is level with the street. 
As a result, the building is half buried into the steep terrain of the property's northern end, so that its southern tip cantilevers over the bottom portion of the site. The effect of these set of moves emphasizes the unique shape of the site, thereby calling attention to the irregularity of the urban fabric in this area. To break up the monumentality of the mass, it is excavated, sliced, and cut into, while shapes are extruded from its top plane. Functionally, this translates into courtyards, pavilion buildings, skylights, and sculptural landscape elements. In the open urban park, the protrusions, or pavilions, organize and frame the space, while the landscape forms texturize its surface. In the enclosed factories, the depressions, or courtyards, organize... Um, So uh, the tra trajectories of the bridge infrastructure also puncture through the factory at different levels, which can, sh which can be read as open linear planes or lines passing through a volume. These layered paths of motion enable and articulate the flow of bicycle traffic throughout the site. Although not strictly a transportation structure, the velodrome is another facilitator of bicycle movement, an open, elongated, ring-shaped object that hovers above the urban park and its pavilions. Hung by cable from two masts on either end, the track is nested within a network of taut lines as its shape informs the contours of the pavilions below and acts as a roof over the urban park. And the bike park is spaced for a different kind of leisure riding is allotted to the area below the race factory building, a landscape made, made entirely out of dirt. This outdoor space is composed of groups of earthen mounds arranged in strategic succession. Uh, the overall effect produced can be understood as a series of stacked floating layers. So this is the urban park plan, which is the very top. This is um, a reflected ceiling plan of the waffle slab ceiling. Um, the mezzanine le um, level of the factory. This is a factory plan. I won't go through all the production process. Um, and then this is the bike park. These are two sections where you can see the velodrome and its structures, and as well as the bridges, and then all the production that's going on inside the. Well, you probably can't see it; it's a bit small, but all the production that's happening inside the factory. Some renderings. This is very close to where I live, by the way. That's why I showed that view outside my apartment. This is the top of the bridge of Dundas, crossing the bridge. So again, I won't go into detail on this, but these are some diagrams of the production zones of the factory. Um, so the factory makes, so the difference between this factory and, well, we don't have any there's one company in Canada that makes bicycles from scratch. Everything else we import from most from Asia, mostly China. Um, but we don't have any factories in North America that build bikes from scratch, like build the frame and assemble all the components. So this is what this factory does. Um, I mean, sure, there's like small garages, sort of like boutique. Um, bike aficionados who will build their own frames, but not on a massive scale. So this is what I'm proposing for Toronto. Um, and then I also, oh, this is more of the production process inside the factory. Um, spatially laid out to be as efficient as possible. And I also designed a bike. This is probably not relevant to your course, so I'll just <laughs> quickly. Um, so in conclusion, um, the intervention contributes to environmental sustainability by supplying both the vehicle and infrastructure for cycling as a way to encourage the use of bicycles over automotive transport. It serves the city of Toronto by improving the connectivity of the cycling network and opening up a knot in the urban fabric, creating local employment and providing didactic and engaging public spaces. The Hub also offers and celebrates bicycle culture in the city while promoting quality design and manufacturing. 
In this way, the hybrid technology of the project aims to bring light manufacturing activity back into the city by recalibrating public perceptions about the factory. It endeavors to be a symbol for Toronto on the world stage as a leading metropolis in both cycling and manufacturing. Thank you.